Today is kind of a special, hey Chachi, <laughs> it's kind of a special day for me. Um, today is my dad's birthday. He'd be 105, except for that uh, 20 years ago, uh, this last March he passed. My dad was uh, really the most Christ-like person I think that I've ever, I've ever known. Not because he was a pastor, but because he genuinely just loved God and loved people. One day, almost uh, 40 years ago, my dad went downtown to take care of some business, and a group of men assaulted him with knives. They stabbed him in the chest, broke his sternum, several ribs, they knocked him unconscious, took a huge sum of money. I was in California at the time, as my dad lay unconscious at Swedish Medical Center, I hopped on a plane, flew home. He was still unconscious on life support when I got to the ICU unit, and I sat there by his bed staring at what looked like a corpse. And it's at times like that that we ask questions of God. I sure did. What did dad do to deserve this? God. He's more like you than anyone I know. Why do you let people hurt other people, kill other people? It was about six years before that that I watched him try it on the floor of the Denver Presbyterian for the Denver, for the Presbyterian Church uh, USA, Denver Presbyterian, the Presbyterian Church USA, and, and I watched people that I knew he dearly loved, slander him. And then the denomination that he had dearly loved remove him from our church. I think it gave him a heart attack. God, why do you let some people kill other people? And I was there 20 years ago, just minutes before my father died. It wasn't his heart that got him, it was his lungs. He had pneumonia. And so he couldn't expire <sighs> so that he could inspire. He had pneumonia because he had interstitial lung disease because he grew up in Sydney, Nebraska during the Dust Bowl. And who's responsible for the Dust Bowl? I blame God. So God, why do you kill people? Now, I know that we often object and say rather silly things like, God doesn't kill people. People kill people. And if the Dust Bowl killed people, it's because Adam sinned. I mean, so Adam made the Dust Bowl and that killed people. God doesn't kill people. Liberals like to argue, oh, God doesn't kill people. Conservatives will argue, well, God does kill some people. Well, God at least kills some people according to God in the Bible. Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. No one can save you from the hand of God. Remember that. Verse 42. I will make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh. Now that's not a throwaway text. That comes at the end of uh, Deuteronomy, and it's part of the Song of Moses, which is utterly fascinating. God tells Moses that Israel is going to break the covenant of law. He's going to get angry, and they're going to be devoured. But Moses is to teach them this song that he teaches to Moses with this line, I kill and I make alive. I kill. He kills everyone on earth with a flood of water, except uh, Noah, quote unquote, herald of righteousness, and seven, seven others. He kills everyone in Sodom with a flood of fire, everyone except, quote unquote, righteous Lot and his two daughters, who don't look all that righteous to me, and he commands Israel to kill people for him. Like everyone in Jericho, they were commanded to, quote, unquote, devote them to destruction. English standard version, although in the Hebrew it should probably really just be translated devote. But God does spell it out. For almost everyone in Jericho, it meant 
slaughter. The Israelites were to kill everyone in Jericho except a harlot named Rahab, who turns out to be Jesus' great, 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 great grandmother, and yet she also is to be devoted. Well, that's just confusing for us. And so we like to think, well, you know, things got crazy in the Old Testament. God even told Abraham to kill Isaac and things, well, you know, so we're not even sure that that God even really said any of that stuff in the Old Testament. And now, now we got the New Testament. Have you read the New Testament? You know, Jesus only had one qualification for discipleship. Pick up a cross and follow me. I mean, sometimes I think we have like utterly forgotten what these things were designed to do. In Acts 5, just after Pentecost, when we think, okay, everything's changed, Holy Spirit's here. The Holy Spirit, through the words of Peter, sure to at least seem to kill Ananias and Sapphira. And then just a little later, kill King Herod. Revelation 19, the word of God And we all know who that is, right? The word of God comes riding out on a white horse in a robe dipped in blood, wielding a sword that issues from his mouth with which he will smite the nations. God at least kills some people. And so we wonder why. And we naturally think, how can I keep him from killing me? How can I save me from the hand of God? Strong right hand of God. We've been preaching through Second Peter. And you know, Peter says such beautiful and encouraging things, right? Do you remember First, Second Peter? They were in Second Peter now. Second Peter one three. God has given us all things that pertain to life through the, these promises, like the imperishable seed. They actually are like the divine nature given to us. Second Peter 1, 9, and if anyone lacks these, the manifestations of these, he's forgotten that he was always cleansed from his former sins. In other words, everybody's been forgiven, and if you sin, it's because you just aren't aware of that fact. Second Peter 1, 13, Peter tells us he's about to put off this tent, because like he taught us in First Peter, We're all going to be unified in one gigantic temple that turns out to be a living body, the very body of our Lord. So he says such beautiful, encouraged things, but then 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, 13, he goes on this long-winded rant about God just killing people, like a whole lot of people. So this is the third sermon in which we've looked at these scary verses. And so I'm hoping that you can remember the other uh, two sermons from, you know, starting three weeks ago before I took a little vacation. But this morning then, I'm just going to summarize most of chapter two, then read chapter three. But as I do, I'm hoping that you're simply asking, consciously asking this question, why is God killing these people? Okay? Okay. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Peter writes, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies or heresies of destruction, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So why does God kill people? Perhaps they deny the master who bought them, who redeemed them, agarazzo. And then Peter, and didn't Peter deny the master who bought him like three times? Well, anyway, Peter starts giving examples. First, he talks about fallen angels, which could refer to this stuff in Genesis chapter 6, or it could refer to all fallen angels that long to take the body of the children of Adam, and so God caused them into Tartarus, or the lowest level of Hades, to keep them until the judgment, which is a little weird. Second, he talks about people who lived before the flood, violent people, people that like to just take life from one another. God killed them, the ungodly, the not worshiping. He killed them with a flood while rescuing Noah along with the seven others. Third, he he talks about the people of Sodom that wanted to remember, know the God men, know them, but know them in the wrong way. They just wanted to take them, that is, uh, rape them. So God 
killed them with a flood of fire while rescuing righteous Lot and his two daughters. So God will kill those people, those sinners that see the good and the life and just take the good and the life. They just consume it for their own pleasure. And then Peter talks about Balaam and his ass. As you know, Balaam was a pagan magician that surprisingly knew Yahweh, the Lord God. But he knew him in the wrong way. He used knowledge of Yahweh to exalt himself as Yahweh. Balaam was rebuked by his dumbass, remember, and the God-man who stood in the way. And so Balaam ended up blessing Israel instead of cursing Israel, and yet Balaam was eventually killed by Israel, for he went on to tempt Israel to also worship Baal. Balaam was like spirituality for hire. Like, you know, a professional pastor. <sighs> Peter claims that the false teachers are committing the sin of Balaam. They're using knowledge of God to exalt themselves and control others. They're using knowledge of Jesus to make themselves Jesus. They seem to be the same false teachers that Paul talks about um, in 2 Timothy, Galatians, and Colossians. In 2 Timothy, he says they're like Janus and Jambres. Remember that? They were uh, the magicians that opposed Moses. In Galatians and Colossians, he mentions that these false teachers imprisoned Christians in the stoikeion. That's Greek for element elements or elementary principles. He refers to them as the circumcision party. If you're ever invited, don't go, the circumcision party. He calls them the circumcision party because they just love the law and then telling people if, if you do these things, um, uh, then you can make yourselves righteous. But Peter and Paul are arguing that they're not making themselves righteous, they're making themselves unrighteous and slaves of the stoikion, the way of the world, cause and effect. We're the cause, we affect things. And, and so they will be, 2 Peter 2, 12, destroyed in their destruction. In other words, God will kill those people. He will kill those religious people that take knowledge of the good to make themselves good, but in fact make themselves evil and slaves of death, for they have crucified the life. You know, as uh, we've preached through 2 Peter chapter 2, I've just been reminded over and over again of Soren Kierkegaard's, remember he was a Danish theologian and philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard's three, st Bill looks like, I didn't know that, but anyway, you should, He's, you check. but anyway, he, he had these three stages along life's way, uh, and he argued that we can operate in all three of these stages or spheres in, in just in just a moment, and we can rise and fall from one stage to another in, in just a moment, but there are all stages that we must all pass through along life's way. They are how it is that we each become who it is that we truly are. I once watched a little video that someone made that compared the journey through all three of these stages uh, to climbing a ladder. So look, I'm going to remove the communion table here, like that, and, and just set up uh, this ladder. Set up this ladder here in front of this skulon uh, in Greek, or eights in Hebrew, this timber or this, uh, this tree. You, you can think of me as climbing this ladder, you know, to pick fruit from uh, this, this tree. Fruit, like the fruit that's on that tree up on, the, up on the screen there. The first stage of the three stages is called the aesthetic stage. In, in this stage, we see, um, that the, we see the good and the life. We see it and we just take it in order to consume it and make it a part of, of us. You know, consume it like, like a demon or the antediluvians, or uh, the men and women of Sodom, or any little kid who happens to quote, see that the fruit is good for food and uh, delight to, to the eyes. And so they take it, not knowing 
what it is. You may remember that this is the way that Eve took the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. She didn't know what the good was or the life is, but she figured it would be good to eat. It looked right, and so she took the right, but the way she took it was wrong, and it didn't make her right. The biblical word for that is righteous. It didn't make her uh, righteous. It didn't make her right. Sex is right. Do you know that? God made it. Alcohol and drugs are right. Riches, wealth is, is right. Food is right. But how we take them can be the very definition of evil and make us very wrong. Jesus is also right. Paul says he is our right. He is our righteousness. So how do you take him? According to Kierkegaard, very pious people can operate in the aesthetic phase all the time, utterly unaware that there is any other way to operate. In other words, all your devotion can be about nothing but acquiring things, like health and wealth, or religious experiences, or Jesus, which means you're not devoted to Jesus, but devoting Jesus to yourself as if he were merely an object for your consumption. I think the New Testament refers to these folks as the harlots and the thieves, the, the sinners, and also the evil and adulterous generation that seeks a sign, but not the one that all the signs point to. They seek Jesus' stuff, not Jesus. In the aesthetic stage, a person seeks salvation through pleasure, but according to Kierkegaard, all the pleasure dies. The sex dies, the wine dies, the experiences die, Jesus dies, and you die. The aesthetic, aesthetic stage ends in boredom according to Kierkegaard. A person gets trapped in the aesthetic stage when they refuse to face the sorrow of their own boredom. But they just keep sucking the life out of drinks and women and men and churches and religious experiences and Jesus, sucking the life out of them like a vampire all the while with ever-diminishing returns because the life has died and they're addicted to death. They're dead and dying, but unable to die. That's the first stage. The second stage is called the ethical stage. In the ethical stage, persons seek to save themselves, that is, exalt themselves, through the knowledge of good and, and evil. In the ethical stage, I try to create myself in the image of God by taking knowledge of the good, right? And taking knowledge of the life. And then applying that knowledge to, to me through my own choices, through my own decisions, through my own judgment, through my own willpower that I like to think is somehow free willpower. Paul calls this justifying oneself with works of the law in the power of the flesh. And, and now you may remember that this also is the way in which uh, Eve was tempted and took the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. The snake told her that it would make her like God. And ironically, in a weird way, it does, but we'd have to talk about that later. But anyway, she saw that the fruit was good for food and a delight to the eyes, stage one, and to be desired to make one wise. Stage two, the ethical stage. Even, even though she really didn't know what wisdom is, or should I say, who wisdom is. She did what every little child does on the day that they look at their mom or dad and think, dad is good. <laughs> and then they look in a mirror and they wonder, am I good? Does dad think I'm good? And so what do they do? They begin to take knowledge of dad in order to impress dad. 
And yet at the same time, they hide from dad in fig leaves and fear, perhaps even jealous of dad, resenting dad, and finally crucifying dad. See, it wasn't the thieves and the harlots that led the chant, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. It was the pastors and the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees. According to Kierkegaard, the ethical stage ends in absolute despair. Frederick Buechner used to tell about this 13-year-old kid. He killed his dad because he resented him. And then about the guard that would listen to him at night in his prison cell as he would weep in the dark. I want my dad. I want my father. I want my, my father, my dad. <laughs> well, in both the aesthetic stage and the ethical stage, we deny the one who bought us don't we? We deny the one who bought us, for we have obviously assumed that we must buy ourselves, that we must redeem our, ourselves by taking the good or making ourselves the good. In both the aesthetic stage and the ethical stage, we crucify the wisdom, the righteousness, the good, and the life. We objectify God and His Word, and in the end, end up utterly alone. And then not only have I uh, crucified God to me, I've crucified my neighbor to me, for I assume that just as I am climbing my ladder, they are climbing their ladder, which makes them what? My competitor, because there's only so much good and life to, to go around. And so I secretly wish everyone to hell, and thereby trap myself in hell, which is loneliness, which is death, or at least the first death, the day you eat it, the day you eat of it, dying you, you will die, said God. But according to Kierkegaard, there is a, a third stage, which he called the religious stage. But by religion, he didn't mean what we normally mean by religion. He meant faith. And you can't get that by, well, any old means. Even though that's what people assume. They assume that Kierkegaard was saying that, and so they use the, some use the analogy of the ladder. They, and we assume that's what God is saying because that's what we say. But you don't get there by climbing a ladder. That is by exalting yourself. What is a human being after all, writes Kierkegaard, and what is his power? What is the highest he, a human being, is able to will? Well, we do not want to defraud the highest of its price, but we cannot conceal the fact that the highest is realized only when a person is fully convinced that he himself is capable of nothing. Nothing at all. Okay, so now let's read our text. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, that was a summary of chapter 2. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved, writes Peter. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets. That's guys like Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Zephaniah, and the commandment, the commandment of the Lord and Savior. Uh, the Lord, you know, commands love, and the Savior gave us a new commandment. Remember, he said, love as I have loved you, and he died for us. He also said, I know that the Father's commandment is, as in John 12, eternal life. So he commands us to die like him and live, to lose our life and, and find it. Verse 2, the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own desires. They will say, where is the promise of his parousia, his effective presence? Morton Kelsey once took a survey of Roman Catholic parishioners, and he discovered that, number one, most had had a life-changing mystical encounter with God. Number two, most had never ever told anyone about it. And number three, the last person on average that they would tell would be their priest. Because he would think they were nuts. Pastors and priests do believe in mystical encounters. But usually only the ones that happen 
at the top of the ladder that they themselves have ascended and are now in control of. Verse 4, they will say, where is the promise of his presence? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. You know, according to the stoichion, cause and effect. We're the cause and we produce an effect. Like, you know, our choice produces the life and the good and the salvation. Verse 5, for they willingly overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth, gay, the, the land, was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. False teachers may talk a whole lot about creation and willingly overlook the creation of themselves. We all do that. I mean, just listen to us talk. We each assume that we made ourselves and must make ourselves, and we will ignore the, the fact that we are not the uncaused cause. Verse 6, and, and that by means of these, that's water and word, right? The world that then existed was deluged with water and, and perished, what was lost. You know, there are ways that you can remain true to the text and explain the flood without resorting to lies about the geological evidence. But for now, I just want to point out that in all our quibbling over incidentals, we miss the point. In 1 Peter, Peter told us that baptism, have you been baptized? Hope so. Baptism corresponds to this. Noah and the flood. For in baptism, we die with Christ. As if Christ died with all those antediluvians. Imagine that. And we rise with Christ as if Christ was the righteousness in sinful old Noah. Well, verse 7, but by the same word, the logos, who, by the way, is the hand of God, uh, by the same word, and the Savior, uh, by the same word, the logos, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up, thesarizo, treasured up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly, the not worshiping. Jesus said, you know, that we must be born of water and spirit, right? He also said that we must be baptized, um, of water or in water and spirit, which he also described as being baptized in water and fire, spirit's fire. Baptism is dying to one cosmos, like one world, like this womb world, and being birthed into another world, another age, an age to come in, into reality. This is after he was baptized with water, Jesus said this. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am constrained until it is accomplished, finished. Jesus was constrained in a body of flesh, wasn't he? Until upon the cross, he became, in the words of Paul, a life-giving spirit. <sighs> And his spirit now fills a new body, a living temple bound together in love, love which is the opposite of exalting the self. It's actually sacrificing the self or presenting the self a sacrifice. Verse 8, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as is one day. As you know, if you've been at the sanctuary for a bit, you know that I believe that time in Scripture looks something like this. We exist on this timeline being made in the image of God on the sixth day of creation. So you're half-baked, and everyone around you is half-baked, and that kind of explains a lot. But the seventh day of creation, when it is finished and everything is good, the seventh day, the eternal day, has invaded the timeline at a tree in the middle of the garden, the tree which we commonly call uh, the cross. The endless seventh day is the day of judgment when God's judgment is reality, and we know it, what Peter will soon call the day of God and the day of eternity. Verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as some count slowness. I know God exists. I've just seen too much. I know He exists. 
and I know that he's good, and I know that he's going to make all things new, but I just get so flippin' frustrated with him that it's taken so stinking long. I mean, I'm always like, come on, wrap it up. <laughs> Verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, Peter Hyatt, and you all that are listening right now. Not willing, not wishing that any should be perished. Apollostai from Apollumi, be lost, but that all should reach repentance. Patient toward you. You get what's going on here? Peter is talking as if each one of us is our own false teacher. Who has denied the one who bought us by thinking that we each uh, have bought ourselves, redeemed ourselves, or must create ourselves. And so each one of us must die. Almost like the day you eat of it, dying, you, you will die. Or maybe we're already dead. God doesn't want us to be dead. For why? We already are dead. God doesn't want us to be perished. For we already have perished. God does not want us to be lost because we already have been lost, are lost. And now he's being slow because he's patient toward me. For perhaps there are different ways to die. Perhaps there are different ways to lose my life or what I thought was my life. There are different ways to meet him the hand of God and the judgment of God. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Jesus and the day will come like a thief. Like the day and Je- like the day, or Jesus, Jesus himself is the day. or Everything is in him or something. Jesus will come like a thief, but check this out. He can't be a thief. Why? because everything that's anything already belongs to him, including you. In the same way the Lord kills, but the Lord cannot murder, for the life he takes is his own life. He is the life. Job said it, he giveth and he taketh away, because it's his life. And we don't seem to know that it's his life and that he'd like us to live it with him. Not out there in our own little tent. The Lord and his day will come like a thief, but he's not a thief. He's our husband. And his day is our honeymoon. But if you don't know that, you might run in terror, hide in fig leaves, terrified of of being raped. And so he's patient toward you. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like, like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, And the stoichion, the elements, the elementary principles will be burned up and dissolved. Did you know that you're made of elements? You're a bag of elements, a bag of dust, a dust bag in space and time. That's what you are. You're that and you're also something that is not of this age. (laughs) The breath of God. Modern Western Christians get so worked up, and, and believe me, I get worked up, I, I, so I'm not blaming anybody, but we do. More than really the rest of the world, we get worked up over the violence in the Old Testament and the idea that God might kill some people. And yet Scripture, I think, is pretty clear that God kills some people because God kills all people, including Jesus who is actually himself, God in human flesh. For the measure he gives is also the measure he gets. He came to die for us, yeah, but also with us. That's why he said, pick up a cross and follow. And now listen closely. He doesn't torture life. We do that, but he does take life. And he did take Christ's life. Or actually, no, he didn't take Christ's life. For Christ freely offered his life, crying, into your hands I commit my spirit. (sighs) So it's not the opposite of love. It's weird how we've spun it to, to mean that. 
It's not the opposite of love. It's actually the revelation of love and life. It's the sacrifice that lies at the heart of the Trinity. It's what those guys, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are doing like all the time. Loving each other. So anyway, I'm saying God kills some people because he kills all people. The day you eat of it, dying, you will die. And that day is this day. God killed humanity with a flood. And your baptism means, okay, God, go ahead and kill me. God killed the people of Sodom and Gomorrah with a flood of fire, and we will all be baptized. Literally, baptism means immersed in fire. God had Israel carry out the harem upon the Canaanites. In the ESV, it's translated devoted destruction, but it really just means devoted. It was human sacrifice. But God doesn't hate the sacrifices. That's what we get entirely wrong about this whole thing. Didn't hate Jesus. The sacrifices are holy to him. And God made it clear that what was his harem did not belong to Israel. It was his harem. In fact, it's the same Semitic root as the Arab word harem. But what do we do? We just drop bombs on Gaza. Baghdad. Hiroshima, as we curse them and wish them to hell. That's far more barbaric than anything ancient Israel was commanded to do. God told Israel that the Canaanites were harem. And then through the prophets, he told Israel that they were also harem. And dang, read your Bible, and that's true. What happened to the Canaanites happened to Jerusalem in a, in a big way. The Israelites were also harem, and not just them, but according to the prophets, all the nations of the world, devoted. We will all be devoted, for we are all the king's harem. Zephaniah 3, 8 through 9, in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them, that's all of them that were devoted that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. I mean, just entertain the idea that God had Israel offer the Canaanites to him to relieve them of their misery and make them new. And yet God would never have any of us use those weapons, for to us he has given us a weapon infinitely more powerful. And yet all of us are still to be devoted. In the Revelation, when the word rides out on the white horse and cuts the flesh from men, it's not just some men. Revelation 19, 18. It's the flesh of all men. It's your flesh. And if someone cuts off your flesh, you, you die. And yet something in you is imperishable. You didn't make it. It is making you. Then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements, the stoichion, will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed, will be exposed. The, earth, the works that are done on it will be exposed. Let, let me ask you, is faith a work that you have done? Or is it the imperishable and divine nature that does us? Is righteousness a work that we have done and can simply do? Or is Christ our righteousness and we are the work that he is doing, the hand of God? Is love a work that we can do, or is love of God, because God is love and we are the work of his hand, so... Are you the work that you have done? Or is that just an evil illusion? Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And there are so many other verses in Scripture that back this up, Old Testament, New Testament, but it only makes sense because he's the Word of God that does everything. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So you might say, well then, Pastor Peter, why are you speaking this word? Maybe the word is speaking me. 
Maybe the word is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of, of the heart. Maybe the word is imperishable seed. Kierkegaard wrote this, the highest is realized only when a person is fully convinced that he himself is capable of nothing, nothing at all. But someone who is conscious that he is capable of nothing has every day and every moment the precious opportunity to experience that God lives. So how do we reach Kierkegaard's third stage? How do we live a life of faith? How do we become right in all the places we've been wrong? How do we love as we have been loved in the image of God? Well, we, I guess, climb this ladder, taking fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden, ingesting the fruit, right, and the seed in the fruit. I mean, in ignorance, we, uh, we try to make a life by consuming the good, and we make ourselves miserable, <laughs> like the prodigal son. Then we try to make a life by taking knowledge of the good, to make ourselves the good, until in despair we realize that we have made ourselves evil. Kind of like the older brother in the outer darkness, weeping and gnashing his teeth. Then uh, to enter the third stage, <laughs> God knocks over our ladder. It happened to Abraham on the holy mountain, according to Kierkegaard, on Mount Moriah. You know, Isaac was his life. Isaac was actually God's life. <laughs> Isaac was everything that Abraham had worked for, his promise. We assume that somehow they hated Isaac. That's just nuts. That's the opposite of the truth. It happened to Moses at the burning bush. And then again on Mount Nebo, after he had struck the rock, instead of speaking to the rock. It happened to Paul at, well, the burning man on the road to Damascus. And it happened to Peter through the burning gaze of the one who would not stop loving him, even though he had just denied him three times and he was suffering a swift destruction. It happens to all of us at the foot of the tree, in the middle of the garden, on the holy mountain. It's where we lose our life and find it. So he, he knocks over our ladder and he gives us himself in fact giving us himself whether we're aware of it or not at the time is the very thing that knocks over our ladder it's amazing grace burning hot grace relentless love Everything happens in order that you might see him as he is. He is our righteousness, not a law, but a living presence. He's our wisdom, not objective knowledge like in a book, but subjective knowledge like living wisdom sitting on the throne in the sanctuary of your soul. He's our life. We see that we took his life when we see that he is our life and he has always given his life to us. He's our faith, our hope, and our love. He is the divine nature in us. And there are different ways to die. John 5, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Has passed from death. Because he was dead. Because of our lack of faith, we all took the fruit trying to make a life but made a prison in which the life has been entombed. That's, that's the first death. It's called the sin of the world. But faith is the death of death. That's the second death, which is the presence of eternal life, the life having risen from the tomb in the garden sanctuary of your soul. So when the body dies, you've already begun to live. 
Because Peter had already died with Christ, he chose to literally be crucified with Christ because, you see, this world had entirely lost its grip on Peter. And so Peter wanted to love. For love had made himself Peter's nature. The divine nature is a sacrificial communion of eternal and ecstatic joy, commonly called love. God is love. And God is outrageously happy. So why does God kill some people? Well, I think because he kills all people. So why does God kill all people? Well, because he has compassion on all people. Because all people are already dead and they don't know they're dead. Like zombies and vampires. Because all people are trapped in a prison that is themselves or that they think is themselves. Because all people are an indestructible spirit trapped in a body of sin and death. Because all people are destined to be one, even as he is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because he's making all people in his image. Because having known the bad, he longs for you to choose the good, which is his judgment, which is eternal life, which is sacrificial love. Because choosing to lose your life is finding your life, which is his life which flows through all creation as ecstatic joy because he wants you to enter his joy the joy of the master so yeah sorry this is unpopular but in case you haven't noticed God violates your will why so he can give you his will his free will Talk about free will. His good free will that you might will reality with him and wake up from the nightmare that you are dreaming for you have imagined that you are your own creator. Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and, and godliness, waiting for and hastening the parousia, the presence of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the stoichion, the elements, will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. We'll talk about that next week. But we're waiting for and hastening the parousia, the manifest. But how do we do that when we can do nothing? Well, in Acts 1, after Jesus, you know, ascends to heaven, Peter, the disciples, and the women, in one accord, devote themselves or are devoted. Acts 1.14, they were devoting themselves to prayer, prasukamai. You know what that means? It just means asking God for stuff. Why? Well, because you can't do this stuff. I bet they asked him for more than just things. I bet they asked him for his presence, the judgment of God, the righteousness of God, the day of the Lord. And in Acts 2, verse 1, the fire fell. And what happened? They all freely chose to do what the law had always told them to do, but they did not want to do. And then in Acts 2, verse 42, they uh, devote themselves some more. They, they just want, they want more. And now I should mention that 40 years ago, my dad devoted himself. He drove himself downtown because he trusted the men with knives that broke his sternum and took all his money. They were doctors, and they gave him a new heart. I mean, they were doing one procedure, and something went kind of wrong, and they ended up doing another procedure, and that's why I had to hop on the plane and everything, but they, they were giving him a new, a new heart. Maybe God's a doctor, and he's taking out your heart of stone and giving you a heart of flesh, and yeah, that seems kind of violent at times. And when I watched all those people take my father's life on the floor of the Denver Presbytery, I also watched my father give his life on the floor of the Denver Presbytery. Actually, over and over and over again for the rest of his life. I, I watched Jesus make my dad look just like himself. And I think they meant it for evil. But God intends all evil for good. And he gets his intentions. And when my dad's body was finally dying, I, I got to give him communion. The last thing he said to me was, thank you. 
I went home to get my clothes, come back, spend the night, but just a minute before I returned, he passed. My sister Lydia, uh, who passed away a little while ago, she said that Peter's dad suddenly looked up into the corner of the room and he got like all excited. And Elena seemed to be getting excited too. Elena with Down syndrome. And then she said, Dad expired. It was, Lydia, it was Lydia's daughter, Elena, that later informed her that she saw Poppy fly away with Jesus and the angels. Now, we may remember in Revelation 14, we met the reaper when we studied the Revelation, and, and he wasn't grim. Remember? Go back and read it. Take a good look at it. Listen to those sermons. The reaper is Jesus. That's what I believe. When he said to the guys, he said, look, I'm going to come and get you. I'll come for you. So the only way to get yourself stuck in hell, listen closely, is to run from the reaper. The life, the hand of God, kills everyone. I think that's what it's saying. And I, for one, cannot think of any better news. Interstitial lung disease didn't get my dad. Chaos didn't get my dad. The devil, sure as heaven, did not get my dad. Jesus got my dad. You know, my dad had pneumonia, so he couldn't expire. That he might inspire. I think Jesus expired him expired him of this age and inspired him with himself. The last thing I said to my dad was, Dad, you don't have to breathe the air of this world anymore. You can breathe God. And I heard him say, thank you. So let's devote ourselves. <laughs> it's the only way to die which is the only way to live. You can't kill yourself. That won't work. You have to present yourself a sacrifice, living and acceptable to God, Romans 12, 1. Be devoted, devote yourself, and, and you don't have to wait for your body to die. You can begin to live his eternal life right now. It's called faith and hope and love. For on the night that he was betrayed by all of us, he took the bread and broke it, saying, um, this is my body given to you. When you see this and realize that you are somehow in this weird way the one that did this, oh, it'll knock your ladder right out from underneath you. <laughs> and he took the cup saying, this is the covenant in my blood. Poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. When you see this, and you remember that the life is in the blood, and that he gives this to you, this will elevate you. This will exalt you in one incredible new body beyond anything that you can even begin to imagine right now. And so pray with me. Lord, you have offered yourself to us. And now we offer ourselves to you. We wait. We long to hasten your manifest presence. In other words, Lord, I think we're, we're saying, and, and I hope you would pray this with me, okay, right? You pray this with me. You can pray it silently in your heart or whatever. Just say this, baptize me with your fire.
This is amazing grace that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. Sometimes I've wondered if we should sing that. You know why? Because I think we assume that when he takes our place, we are some other place. Because we've kind of taught that. It's the penal substitutionary theory of the atonement, that God killed Jesus because he's not going to kill you. Or, or Jesus had to take up his cross because you don't have to take up a cross. But I want us to sing it because he does take our place. It's just that we're still in the same place. And he does bear our cross uh, because we picked up our cross and we're following him and he's going to bear it with us. And he does lay down his life that we would be set free. But where does he lay down his life? Where is that garden? Oh, I think this is the shock. It's in the sanctuary of my soul. And so when I devote myself to God, who's devoting me? Him. He does everything. And I observe it. Until that day that we do everything together. He is faith, hope, and love in me. And that, my friends, is amazing grace. And now I know all of this kind of, this stresses people out. The whole talk about dying and living and all that stuff. And I hope you wouldn't all be stressed out because you already knew you were going to die, right? So I'm just saying God's in charge of the whole thing. So chill out. And, uh, but, but, but then this is also so cool. If you're like me and neurotic, you're like, yeah, but God, I don't want to deny you and I might deny you and blah, 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 blah. Well, the, I, I don't know if you've ever noticed this and this will be really quick, but this is important. John 13 at the Last Supper, um, Peter says to Jesus, you know, after Jesus has revealed kind of what's going down, he says, oh, I know why I can't see real well. I don't have my glasses on. I will lay my life down for you. He says, he says to Jesus, I will lay my life down for you, right? And Jesus had just told him, because Peter said, you know, uh, you can't go where I'm going now, but you will follow. And one day Peter would day lay his life down for Jesus, right? And Jesus would help him do that. Jesus would do it in him. He says, I will lay my life down for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay your life down for me, Peter? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Oh. All the stuff Jesus said about denying him and everything, that's got to be just absolutely brutal for Peter. But listen closely. There's a chapter division right there. The chapters were put in your Bible, I think maybe by the evil one, like about 500 years ago, because this is what he says next, okay? Jesus answered, will you lay your life down for me, Peter? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Let not your hearts be troubled. Wow! Everything is happening according to plan. And God never let you go. So let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, said Jesus. In other words, by way of benediction, believe the gospel. Amen.